this is the genetics unit and we'll be working through the different topics in that unit beginning first with the history of DNA and its structure. The structure of DNA will largely be a review for us. Remember DNA is a nucleic acid that is made up of three parts a phosphate group, a pentose sugar, or five carbon sugar, and that sugar is deoxyribose in DNA, and then a nitrogenous base. A nitrogenous base for DNA can either be cytosine or thymine as a pyrimidine or adenine guanine as a purine. We typically just refer to these as CTAG. Uh, uracil is an Another nitrogenous base, but it is only found in RNA. And the differences between RNA and DNA we'll get to later. A little bit more concerning DNA. DNA is a double helix, as you can see here. It's a double spiral shape. And the two sides of the helix are connected in the middle with hydrogen bonds. And along the rails of this ladder, using covalent bonds. The hydrogen bonds in the middle, of course, don't take as much energy to separate. And the base pairing, all oh, the T's and A's are always joined together and C's and G's are always going to join together. Now, as far as discovering DNA's um, hereditary component, uh, that took some time for the science community to come around to that. It began with this man, Frederick Griffith, and he was an army doctor studying uh, pneumonia and stumbled upon this idea of bacterial transformation, which is that bacteria will take up DNA from an outside source and that will cause them to be changed. Griffith didn't know that it was DNA that was causing it to be changed, but that's what happened. And this is his experiment. <coughs> and just for a brief overview of this experiment, uh, the two left, the two uh, left-hand side of this experiment were largely a control group. You can see that he took the group of S cells or harmful cells. These are cells that he knew or bacteria that he knew caused pneumonia. He injected those into the mouse and the mouse died. He took the R cells or the harmless cells and injected those into mice and they lived. That is largely what he would expect to occur. When he killed the S cells or the smooth cells or harm, harmful cells, he killed them with heat and then injected those dead cells into the mice and they lived. Of course, that's what we'd expect, that dead cells would not be able to kill the mice. Well, he took these two cells here, the harmless cells that he had initially injected into the mouse and they lived and then the heat killed harmful cells and injected those into the mice and they lived. And then that mixture caused the mouse to die. Why is that? Well, the harmless cells took the DNA from the harmful cells and it changed them. It caused them to be transformed. Griffith didn't know what was happening here. He did. He had some ideas, but he said that what was happening is there was some sort of instructional agent that was causing that DNA to be changed or a transformational agent. And this idea of bacterial transformation is something that is still used today. Um, but Griffith didn't really know what that it was DNA that caused this change. By and large, the scientific community believed that proteins were the molecules that were inherited from one generation to the next. And so they weren't sure. So along comes this man, Oswald Avery, several years later. Avery basically retests Griffith's experiment. But what he is attempting to find out is what is this instructional agent? He wants to figure out what it is that's actually causing the change in the bacteria. And after he did his tests, he stated that DNA was indeed this molecule that caused the change. He basically isolated DNA as the change agent. And this caused a lot of controversy in the scientific community because they weren't really sure what DNA 
was. They knew that it caused or coded for proteins. So they thought it was too simple to be um, the molecule that was the hereditary information and that proteins were very large molecules and obviously this is what's going on. And so there was some controversy until these two came along, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase. Um, you will just always see them together as the Hershey Chase experiment. They definitively proved that DNA is the transformation agent, is the hereditary information. And they did their experiments with viruses called bacteriophage. These are viruses that attack bacteria exclusively. And they are made of two things. They're made of protein and DNA. That's very helpful in this particular experiment. So those are the two uh, objects in question. So here's a picture of their experiment. And you can basically see what's going on here. The, the There's two radioactive molecules that were used, or atoms that were used. Radioactive sulfur. Sulfur is an uh, important component in proteins. It is found in a couple of the amino acids. It's important for the disulfide bridges, if you remember that. And so if you mix radioactive sulfur in with some proteins, some of those proteins are going to have that sulfur in them, and then you can track that radioactive. It's like a, it's like a flag. And so they, some of the bacteria phages took up the radioactive sulfur, and they were, they, it was coating their, their, you know, their parts, the, their protein parts, their capsid, and the DNA on the inside, of course, didn't have any of this radioactivity. The bacteria then were infected by these bacteriophages, and the bacteriophages went away, and the DNA was left behind, and there was no trace of that radioactive element in the subsequent generations of bacteria, meaning that the protein isn't what was passed from one generation to the next. In the next experiment, they used radioactive phosphorus. Phosphorus is an important element found in DNA. The phosphate group, of course, has that. And so you see here, rather than the protein coating having the radioactivity, it's the DNA itself. That DNA is injected. You can see the bright blue here. That bright blue is found from one generation to the next meaning that DNA is what is being passed from one generation to the next. And so Hersey Chase proved with 100% accuracy that DNA is this transformation agent that carries information from one generation to the next. Very important. Another guy that was important is Erwin Shargaff. Shargaff came up with an idea called Shargaff's Rule. Very original. And Shargaff's Rule basically says this that the percentage of adenine in the cell is always going to be equal to the percentage of thymine, and that the percentage of guanine is always going to be equal to the percentage of cytosine, so that if you know the composition of one, you can find the other three. If, adenine, if there's 20% adenine, if there's 20% thymine, that means that there's 60% of the DNA is left, so that guanine and cytosine split those down the middle 30-30, and so you kind of get the idea here. Shargaff it was important for understanding that base pairing concept. Another important person in this discovery was Rosalind Franklin. In the early 50s, she performed a technique called X-ray crystallography. I think I have that written here. X-ray crystallography. And the idea behind X-ray crystallography is that you're basically discovering the shape of a molecule. And so she was attempting to find the shape of DNA. And she took a picture of DNA, not looking at it from the side, like you see in this picture, but more so looking down the tube, so to speak. Looking, if you know, take this picture, looking down the tube. And what did she see? Well, she saw this, uh, an X and meaning that there was those crosses happening in the middle, those hydrogen bonds, those nucleic acids, or those nit nitrogenous bases connecting in the middle, which means that this must have had some sort of spiral shape to it. Rosalind Franklin was on the verge of this discovery, of discovering the uh, idea and the shape of DNA, and she passed away at a young age. So next, these guys come along. 
Watson and Crick, and in 1953, they constructed the first accurate model of the DNA molecule. They used Shargaff's work, Franklin's work, and all the work coming before them to fill in the gaps that they could not figure out. This is normal for science. And they came up with this idea, A's to T's, C's to G's, hydrogen bonds, um, and that double helix shape that we are so familiar with. And here's them actually standing inside the model that they created.